Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for our Sunday night service. Brother Glenn, if you do me a favor, close at least one of those usher doors. We're going to try to keep the cool inside and the heat outside. And uh, that's sometimes a little bit of a challenging thing to do. So we're going to start by singing tonight. Go ahead and grab your songbooks, and uh, Brother Carl is going to lead us in a song. Okay, turn to number 246. Standing, please. 246. sing, especially after our vacation Bible school meeting, where we have the theme Noah's Landing. And so for some reason, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground sounds very, very appropriate, considering the subject matter. And to those involved in vacation Bible school, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's a very uh, much an encouragement to my wife and I uh, to see you ready to jump in. And for those of you uh, that have been with us VBS before, you, you know what VBS is like and you're jumping in anyway. And for those of you who have not done VBS, ah, they don't know what they're getting into, but we're gonna have a great time. So let's have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing on the service uh, tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We're thankful people, thankful to be saved, thankful that, uh, you looked on us in love, and you cared for us. You saw we were sinners, and you died for us anyway. And we are so grateful. We realize we're undeserving, but I'm so glad that uh, you love your creation and that you desire to adopt us into your family. And so now being part of your family, I pray that we would learn to live like your children and to look at you as our Father. And so help us through praising you tonight and certainly through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated, and we will continue to sing, Brother Carl. Okay, let's turn to number 188. 188. Happiness is the Lord. Amen.
wonderful singing. I feel like something's missing. I'm trying to figure out what it is. What is missing? I know it's missing. There's a, we're missing a song. The song is Happy Birthday. We're missing that song. Okay? And, you know, we've been missing it for a while, and so we've missed one, we've missed some people. Their birthdays have come and gone, and uh, they haven't said anything. Uh, so what I need here is I need the, bapti the Baptist birthday confession system to be activated. And this is how the Baptist birthday confession system works. This is where those of you in the congregation confess the birthdays of others. Okay, so is there a birthday that needs to be confessed? Can anybody think of a birthday to confess? I need somebody, I need a hand here. We need to confess the birthday of another. Dave. There is a birthday that is about three days and no confession. Okay, so Joanne's birthday has been confessed. Okay, we got one down. Okay. Um, another one, Mrs. Watkins' birthday is Saturday. That has been confessed. Now, these are birthdays in the present. It is my understanding that somewhere in the congregation, there's also a birthday in the past that has not been confessed. Okay, who are you pointing to? Who could it be? Okay, you're pointing to your mother-in-law. Is it safe for you to do that? Okay, Mrs. Miller, her birthday came and went as well. Do we have any others? Are we missing anybody? Okay, we're ready. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Oh, I feel so much better. There's now unity in the body. It's a wonderful thing. Okay, make mention of a few things here. Again, uh, those of you involved in Vacation Bible School, we are compiling your information. And um, if, uh, if you have any questions as we're preparing, uh, feel free to ask. Um, you know, if uh, the craft area, of course, ask Mrs. Andreessen. Game area, ask me or Darren. Um, for anything regarding the teaching, ask Mrs. Watkins. And uh, anything regarding the skits, you can ask me. But anyway, if you have questions, there's a lot of things. Uh, that will need to be prepared and so just uh, you know just feel free to ask away or we'll try to give you answers we are going to need candy and cookies okay the candy can be purchased now the the cookies you, you'll want to usually just wait get a little bit closer to the time i mean even downstairs we're gnawing on the fbi class we're gnawing on chips ahoy cookies uh, that were purchased for the I Love America conference, and they're already beginning to get a little bit stale. And so that doesn't prevent us from eating them. We still do. Um, but anyway, just letting you know, it's usually better if the cookies are a little fresher. And so letting you know that. And uh, anyway, but we will definitely uh, need those things. Uh, looking, looking ahead again, um, uh, this Saturday, men, we have a breakfast this Saturday. That is at 8.30, men's breakfast and meeting. And once you are done with breakfast, I guess there's more food in town after that. I guess uh, Kevin and Larissa are coming into town. They're going to be at Community Park at 1130. And a rumor has it there's food there too. Okay, that's a true rumor. So and uh, anyway, just letting you know that. And so anyway, they're in town. And this is kind of an early kind of guys. We just kind of hang around and eat. Ladies, you're kind of having a baby shower type thing at that and of course you know there's a baby shower for tj two weeks later that is an evening baby shower around 5 30 and i have the information posted on the bulletin board for that uh, so anyway letting you know that again make mention here uh fbi elective class again i encourage those of you in fbi go ahead and read your class notes that is considered your homework and so it's good to read that get caught up we've got one more class on thursday and then you'll read your class notes in your study sheet. Two weeks after Thursday will be the exam for that class on biblical worldview. So letting you know that. Um, thank you to those of you who have turned your camp forms in already. You've got those filled out. You've turned those in already. Uh, that helps because that way I can get the, the master files ready 
uh, for heading off to camp. We are making a change though. We are not going to leave at 6 a.m. Some of you are wiping, wiping your brow already. Uh, we will be loading the shuttle at 7 a.m. So we're loading at 7. And so just letting you know, it's going to be a little bit later. For those of you who are wondering, we are fighting a little bit of a deadline. Registration in Montana is between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. And so, you know, we will be there probably in the later part of that registration, but I'd rather not get there after 4 and, uh, you know, it creates issues for them. So anyway, so that's what we're looking at, just so you know, and uh, making a mention of that. Um, two weeks, two weeks from tonight is an ice cream social. If anybody wants to borrow the church ice cream maker, uh, you certainly can do that. If you're already developing ideas of making ice cream or something like that, uh, we have a wonderful time uh, regarding that. And so making mention of those things, uh, again, continue to pray for Megan and Andrew as things continue to move forward uh, for them, and we're grateful for that. And I think and I hope I have mentioned everything I'm supposed to. So at this time, we're going to sing a couple more songs. Okay, number 198, 198, his eye is on the sparrow, amen.
singing tonight. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Sometimes on these hot summer days, it gets a little warmer here in the sanctuary. And uh, I can tell you, maybe it's cool right down there at the floor level. It is warming up right here, I'll tell you that. And so, but we're, we're working on it. We uh, we've have the uh, heating and cooling company. They're running tests to make sure that uh, our, our Freon is not all leaking into the atmosphere. And uh, anyway, I know they're at work because uh, they accidentally dropped the dye tube that they injected our system with. They dropped it in the parking lot. So I know they were here, and uh, they've done something. But I'm trying to get information to make sure that they're testing that. Uh, if, you, if you need water, um, uh, Brother Glenn knows where a secret stash is. So if for some reason you have a need, um, he can kind of let you know that uh, if you have a need of some urgency. 1 Kings chapter 18, we're looking at verse 41 tonight. And this is very, very interesting. When we deal with um, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and then we deal with Elijah running from Jezebel and hiding in the mountains and having a pity party, sometimes we miss the small account that is very important and yet creviced in between. And I want to speak on that account tonight. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, look at verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. What is very interesting, and, and maybe one of uh, the better kept secrets in the Bible passage, is when the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal took place, Ahab was there. And we, we sometimes, we don't pay attention to that, and we don't realize that, and uh, there's something very intriguing about that, because you're going, well, I thought Ahab would be nastier. No, Jezebel was nastier. We're going to learn a little bit about what happened to Ahab in the process here. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, <clears throat> like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please now I pray that you would use your word to help us in our lives. You are the miracle-making God. And we come before you confessing that we are a not-so-patient people, but that regardless of our character, you are still consistent with your character. And so we come to you to depend on your character tonight to know that you are the God of the miracle and to know that you are the God of the answer. And we pray that you would help us with your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This is a really unusual short section of scripture because when we look at King Ahab in the earlier time, he says to Elijah, Art thou he that trouble is Israel? And he's, he's, he's being angry and gruff and kingly. And yet, during the contest with the prophets of Baal, 
He was a spectator. And during this time now where Elijah is praying for rain, Ahab is a spectator. And it's very interesting how even though he was present in the narrative, it was a very quiet presence in the narrative. I'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> Not only that, the servant was a weather spotter. That's what the servant was there for. He was there to look in the sky and look at the weather and tell people if weather was coming. Elijah, of course, is the man of prayer. And that is his important place in this narrative. The man of faith and the man of prayer. As is usual and as should be, God is the main attraction. And what who God is and what God is is able to do. Now, this is a passage of faith and prayer involving a man or a person like you and me. How do we know that there was not anything overly special about Elijah? Well, we know that because the Bible tells us that. The Bible tells us he's just a person like you and me. In James chapter 5, verse 17, it says Elias, and of course this is talking about Elijah. This is the Greek transliteration of his name. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. The title of this message is very simple. It's a very quick exhortation in two areas. Keep praying and keep looking. Got it? Keep praying and keep looking and let me give you three observations. You know I have more than three observations, but I got three primary observations here that I want to talk about. One is this, and this is a rather amazing thing about Ahab, who we look at as being the enemy of God. I sometimes wonder what would have happened to Ahab if he married different. You know, he married the most wicked woman on the planet at the time. <clears throat> and it says that Jezebel stirred Ahab up to do tremendously evil things. But I want you to notice something about Ahab, and I want us to put this in your mind. During this period of time, Ahab learned to trust the man of faith. Remember, he stood around and he watched the fire fall from heaven and consume the offering and the water and the stones. I mean, when God was done accepting the offering, there was nothing left. There wasn't either, there was only bare earth where the altar had been standing. And all the people of Israel fell down and said, The Lord, He is the God. And Ahab standing back there going, yeah, I bet that's the case. Because look at what happened after that. Remember, Ahab was the one who ordered people around. After that, Elijah's the one who's ordering Ahab around. Look what happens. He says here, he says after the prophet contest, look at verse 41 as we look here again. And he just says, and Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there's the sound of abundance of rain. What does Ahab do? Okay. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. Basically what he said to Ahab was this. He said, Ahab, take a meal break. Just go off and eat something. Ahab said, okay. And he went off and ate something. You know, who's in charge now? Very, very interesting. And... Then, if you look here toward the end of the passage, if you go here to what I find interesting in verse 44, he says, Go up, say to Ahab, prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop me not. 
So what does Ahab do? Okay, gets in his chariot and rides to Jezreel. At this point, he's doing everything that Elijah is telling him to do. Ahab learned to trust the man of faith. Would you say that you have a lot of faith? Or would you say, <clears throat> I'm the kind of person that struggles with faith? Well, what is the point of Ahab here? The point is this. If you struggle with faith, get around somebody that has some. This is the whole point of this. You have Elijah, who's a man of faith. You have Ahab, who's not. It's a real good idea to get around somebody who has a lot of faith. It may help your life. You're going, well, maybe I'll drag him down. I don't think so. And so if you're struggling, start looking around. Say, well, wow, that person trusts God. I better find out what makes that person tick. I better find out how they learn to trust in God. By the way, trust in God is a learned thing. It's not like somebody pops out of the womb and says, I'm going to trust in God all my life. That's not how it works. Usually there's a process of learning to trust in God. If you look at the life of Abraham, you can see a process where Abraham learned to trust in God. And so with Elijah, we don't know everything about the process, but Elijah learned to trust in God. If you struggle with faith, get around somebody who has some. Number two, if you want to see God do big things, you will be on your knees. So then you know that. Looking here, uh, Elijah was very much on his knees. It says, Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. I mean, he got on his face before the Lord. Well, what was he doing? He's praying for rain. Why was he praying for rain? Well, you know, he's the one who got it to stop in the first place. He prayed to God, stop the rain. God stopped the rain. He says, okay, it's time to start the rain. I just had the nation of Israel say, the Lord, he's the God. Okay, it's time to start the rain. We just had an entire nation of people say, God, you're God. It's time to start the rain. It's time you had a bunch of people that now gave voice that they believe in God. It's time to start the rain. It's time to start the blessing back up again. And so this is what happens. And so we look here, and by the way, you will be on your knees for a while. It won't be a little while. It'll be a while. And he was on his knees for a while. And you go, how long was I he on his knees? Long enough for his serpent to hawk, hike to the top of Carmel? Look. I don't see anything. Go back. It's, taking, it's going to take a little longer than this. I don't see anything. Go back. Okay, you get the picture. I can stop here. You have the illustration. By the way, it took him a while. Um, Carmel's not a little mountain. And so anyway, hiking to the top of Mount Carmel, by the way, that's almost 1,800 feet in elevation, getting to the top of the mountain where you can see the Mediterranean, really, really good. And uh, looking up there, I don't know where Elijah was on the mountain, but he's in the mountain somewhere. And, you know, so anyway, and so here's all you, here's all you know what's happening on, on Carmel. With Elijah, you hear nothing except him talking to God and begging God for terrain. You hear the tromping and crunching of the sandals of the man who keeps going up to the top of the mountain back. And you hear the munching of Ahab eating a meal. And so those are the things that are going on in Carmel right now. And understand that if you want to see God do big things, it's going to take a while. First of all, it takes fervency. The Bible indicates that. Look with me at James chapter 5, verse 16. And it was put in to give us an idea of the heart and character of Elijah. 
And in verse 16, we have, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. And then it says this, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So if you want to see God do big things, it's going to take fervency. It's going to take, it's not going to be a half-hearted prayer. It's not going to be something where our mouths are engaged, but everything else is disconnected. It's going to take heart. It's going to take emotion. It's going to take feeling. It's going to take yearning. It's going to take begging. It's an earnest prayer. We are begging God for something. And if you don't understand fervency, okay, parents, then think, those of you who had teens, when your teenager is really, really hungry and wants to eat something. And at first they ask you, well, when are we eating? Well, it's going to be a while, okay? And they ask you again 10 minutes later, and there's a degree of fervency to what they're asking about, okay? Or they want to borrow the car. There's a degree of fervency. They really, really want to do something. They really, really want to buy something, meaning they want you to buy something. But there's a degree of fervency and there's a degree of begging. Sometimes there's crying, especially if you're a dad and it's a daughter. If you're a dad and it's a daughter, then there's strong crying and tears as big as a crocodile's and whatever it takes to get their word across, okay? Let me give you an idea of fervency. Delilah speaking to Samson and pressing on him, you don't really love me because you won't tell me where your strength comes from and bugging and crying. But anyway, and I'm not saying it's an insincere fervency. When it comes to God, it's a sincere fervency. But you're asking and you're begging. And one, it takes fervency. But number two, it takes faultlessness. What does faultlessness mean? It takes a right heart and a right behavior. It says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Remember, there's a, there's a couple of other places where it talks about, um, you know, a, a person who asks amiss because he just wants to get stuff from God. Lord, this is Jimmy. Gimme, gimme, gimme. God is a great big gumball in the sky. I'm just supposed to turn the handle and the gumball is supposed to come out. And the gumball isn't coming out. And so I'm having a fit because the gumball's coming out. And God goes, you're not going to serve me with that gumball. It takes fervency. It takes faultlessness. A right heart and a right action. And it takes frequency. It takes keeping at it. And keeping at it. And keeping at it. Prayer is almost never a once and done. I had it happen to me one time, but that doesn't mean that I think this is how God operates all the time. One time I was driving a 1966 Chevy Impala. I got rid of my 1968 old Vista Cruiser station wagon because I thought getting a 1966 Chevy Impala would be an improvement. It was a smaller car. It was a smaller engine. Certainly it would get better mileage. How wrong I was. Because there is a difference between the old Vista Cruiser station wagon and the 66 Chevy Impala. The old, the 68 old Vista Cruiser station wagon ran really, really well. And it had a lot of power. And it got about 14 miles to the gallon. Okay? Which for a 1968 old Vista Cruiser station wagon was a good thing. But I was not content. I thought if I get a smaller car, I will get better mileage and I will get around better. And so I picked up the 1966 Chevy Impala with the window in the back that was no longer sealed and so the water leaked in and you could smell the mold and the must and the mildew and found out later that there were spider, there were spider cracks in the freeze plugs all around the engine because probably it had froze one time and I didn't know that. And the thing only got 12 miles to the gallon and would constantly die wherever I was. It just, when it started, it'd die on the road. It'd die in the city. It would die in the country. And I'd have to work to constantly limp that thing along. And one time I was driving that 1966 Chevy Impala down the road, and I cried out to God, and I said, God, 
this car is going to eat me out of house and home. Can you please help me? I need another car, and I forgot I ever prayed it. And three weeks later, my brother called me on the phone and said, a Christian psychology professor at Mount Hood Community College is selling a Ford Pinto for $125. I thought, wow. And I said, well, what do you know about it? And he said, well, he said it was owned by a widow before uh, he owned it. He said the widow drove it 39,000 miles, and uh, he drove it, so it now had 72,000 miles on it. And, you know, we're now in the late 1980s, and so you've got a Ford Pinto, late 1980s, 1972 Ford Pinto, with only 72,000 miles on it. I went, okay. Oh, and by the way, he just put new, wheel, new tires on it. So I bought a 1972 Ford Pinto for $125. It got 30 miles to the gallon for two years. What a great deal that was. And God answered my prayer just like that. Then the weld came off the bottom of the radiator and all the water rushed out of the radiator and the car seized up on the freeway and I didn't know why because it didn't have a temperature gauge. All it has was a temperature light and the light never went on. The reason the light never went on is because the sensor sensed nothing because there was no water to sense. It all went out the bottom. And so I pulled over the freeway, go, I don't know why my car seized up. I took the gallon of water that I had to put in the radiator, and I poured it in the radiator, and I was so amazed because every ounce of water I was pouring in the radiator was coming out right on the ground. And that's when I realized the weld had come off and just popped off, and water was just going through the radiator. And so I took it to a mechanic, and he opened it up, the mechanic at the church, and he said, yeah, you have three good pistons. The fourth one vaporized, and there's melted metal everywhere. And he says, I don't think you're going to want this car anymore. I said, what do we do? He says, I don't know. We'll try to sell it. And so he found a person who loved Ford Pintos. Can you imagine this? A person who loves Ford Pintos, and he, he uh, towed it or limped it away for 75 bucks. So for two years, I drove a car, and I was only $50 short after I was done with the car. That's how much God can answer prayer. And that was a once and done. Imagine what God would do if we were really serious about praying to him. What an amazing thing. You see, Ahab learned to trust the man of faith. We need to do the same. Number two, if you want to see God do big things, you're going to be on your knees for a while. It's going to take fervency and it's going to take faithfulness and it's going to take frequency. But finally is this, and this is kind of interesting, because a lot of the times, even when we look at this story, we don't pay too much attention to the servant. But here's the, here's the thing. If you're looking for an answer, you better point yourself in the right direction. Go, so what do you mean? Look at verse 43. And he said to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. And you're going, why was Elijah very specific? Okay, let me talk to you about Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is part of a mountain range in western Israel. The mountain is about 18,000 feet in elevation. Okay, to the west of Mount Carmel is the Mediterranean Sea. To the east of Mount Carmel is the Jordan River Valley that dips well below sea level and then it goes up the other way. And then you're looking off at the Arabian Peninsula. And let me tell you something about the Arabian Peninsula. It is hot. How often is the Arabian Peninsula hot? All the time hot, okay? And so here is what happens. Sometimes the wind is coming in from the southeast. That is not a cool breeze. That is a, that is a flaming desert hot wind. And that hot wind comes into the Jordan River Valley where it goes down in elevation and gets even hotter. And then it goes up the hill. And as it goes up the hill, all that hot air goes up to the top of Mount Carmel and then dumps 
into the land where Tel Aviv is and everything like that, and it runs out toward the Mediterranean, and it is flaming hot. And that hot air dumps into there, which means that at the top of Mount Carmel, when that happens, it can be 100 degrees on the top of the mountain, and everybody else is far more uncomfortable than that. I just described to you the nation of Israel for three and a half years. Nothing but an east hot wind blowing out to sea, no hope of a single cloud or a single raindrop coming from that direction. Elijah tells his servant, look toward the sea. Because the only hope of rain is coming from that direction. And sometimes we get ourselves turned around and we are looking for the answers in all the wrong places. And we're not looking to God. We're looking for the equivalent of the Saudi Arabian desert to provide the answer for us. We're trying to solve it ourselves. The rain only comes from the sea. Now, then the other thing you need to look is that Elijah said, go again seven times. And this is something important to know about God's character. And I do not understand this, but this is the way God works. God is noted for sending the answer the final time. And so if he tells you to look seven times, you're not going to have anything happen for the first six times. That's just the way it's going to be. And if you really want to know if that's the case, then ask Naaman, the Syrian general who had leprosy, who dipped himself in the Jordan. How many times, class? Six out of seven times, nothing. Time number seven came the answer. And this is the way it is. And sometimes, you know, we need to give God the time that God expects us to give him so he will act and do the big thing, but we've got to wait till the final time. And we've got to wait till the seventh time. And sometimes what the seventh time means is that you're down to your last dime, you're down to your last nerve, you're down to your last everything, but God is coming at the last time. That is when he's going to come. And so then you picture, you go, well, what kind of servant? What do you think that servant looked like? I don't know. Air temperature, 95 degrees. Nothing. A little less spring in his step. Air temperature, 97 degrees. Uh, can I have some water? No, it's coming. Okay. Seven times. I see something. I doubt there's a raindrop in that little thing. I see a little cloud out there. It's just a little thing. It's about the size of a man's hand. Did you bring your umbrella? Do I need one? Yep. Tired, sweaty servant. But he did go up all seven times. And here is the thing. When the answer starts to come, you better get ready. And the Bible says, And it came to pass the seventh time, Behold, there riseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he didn't understand the significance of it, except that uh, Elijah knew there had been no little cloud size of a man's hand or anything come out of that sea for three and a half years. The wind was shifting. The wind was changing. Because in Israel, when the wind's coming from the east, there's never going to be any rain. And when that wind shifts off the sea, 
Oh, it's coming. And even in their national history, there is a history of a whole lot of gully washers that came into Israel when the weather came off the Mediterranean Sea. And he said to say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then there's this very, very interesting verse. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Uh, the entrance of Jezreel. He had a kick in his step. Why did he have a kick in his step? Because of answered prayer. Because of the working of Almighty God. You want to get a little kick in your step, you just watch God work. And you'll discover that you've got a secret adrenaline section in you. And this is what happened to Elijah. Because answered prayer is its own motivator. And it's amazing how you can get ahead of steam going on in your life. When you either trust God or get a hold of somebody who does. You get on your knees for a while. And you beg God for something. And you get yourself pointed in the right direction. So you're looking for the right place for the right answer. I'm here to tell you the Lord is the right direction. Once that happens. You're going to get moving. And when you do get moving. Don't slow down. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we realize we wouldn't be anything without you. And uh, we realize that we need your help and that we need your strength. We need you to make a difference. If only we'd spend more time with you. If only we'd talk to you more. If only we'd trust you more. If only we'd look to you for the answers more often. I pray that you would stir our hearts. That as you answer our prayers, we would rejoice together all the more. And move ahead for you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. The song is number 163. 163. The song is 163. It says only trust him. But this song would work if you just said trust only him. It would work just as well with that. But let's sing this song. If God stirred your heart, the altar is open. As we sing. Amen. 